If you want to hear how the next Stephen King remake may be teased at the end of it chapter 2, then stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Things You Missed. I'm traveling this week, so I'm not in the studio, but I did get my own copy of It Chapter 2, so I scrubbed through it and found surprisingly a lot more that I hadn't caught in theaters. If you haven't seen my original 71 Things You Missed, I'd recommend you watch that one first, but assuming you have seen it, let's get into the Things You Missed. One thing I brought up when covering the first It was the constant cosmic references that set up Pennywise's origins from outer space in the second movie, and I did notice some teases in the second chapter as well. The Ferris wheel at the festival is called the Astro, the carnival mural features sun and moon paintings, and we can see that Eddie's phone is a Galaxy S8. This all ties into the ritual of Chud, which they eventually use to try to defeat It. In the novel, the backstory is expanded, and we learn more about the ancient rivalry between It and its rival, Maturin the Turtle. I pointed out some references to the turtle in the last video, but I found even more such as this one in Henry's room at the asylum. Mike also speaks of a root that the Native Americans believed had mystic properties, which he also puts in Bill's drink so that he too can see the ritual of Chud. Roll it. They're holy men. They're holy of holies. He took me in. Turns out, I'm not gonna make you away. Fed me their sacred matura. The turtle isn't referred to as Maturin in the novel It's, but we learn the name Maturin and more lore in Stephen King's Dark Tower series. We first meet adult Bill on the set of the movie that he's adapting from his own novel, Attic Room. If you pause here, you can get a better look at the book version, and it's massive, much like the novel It. And there's a foreword by someone named Jason Ballantine. When we later see the copy of his other book, The Black Rapids, Jason Ballantine is also responsible for the foreword. This is a reference to the editor of both It's and It Chapter 2. Usually when we see a crew member reference like that, the art department makes references to themselves, so it's kind of nice that the editor got some love in this one. The next part is something that I did notice in theaters, but I almost couldn't believe my own eyes and ultimately just thought that I must have imagined it and thus didn't put it in the previous episode. So the movie that they're shooting is called Attic Room at Warner Brothers Studios, but on this camera tape, the memo doesn't say Attic Room, it says Attic Panic. But what is Attic Panic? Well, It Chapter 2 takes place in 2016, and one big horror movie that Warner Brothers released in 2016 is Lights Out, directed by David Sandberg, who was hired after posting his short film Lights Out to YouTube and it being massively successful. One of his other shorts on YouTube is called Attic Panic. If you've seen my episode on Annabelle Creation, you know that many of the concepts from Attic Panic made it into Annabelle Creation as well, which of course is made by Warner Brothers. The date on this label says 10-10-2018, which is obviously impossible since the film takes place in 2016, but probably is just a fun little reference to the day that this scene of It was actually shot, since we can literally see it says It too right here. I've also pointed out this cameo by Peter Bogdanovich, but not the fact that he's wearing a Vistow pin. Vistow stands for Volunteers in Service to Orson Welles, a reference to another movie where Bogdanovich Donovich plays a director. When Mike calls up the other losers, his area code is from Bangor, Maine. The novel It was written in Bangor, and it's said to serve as an inspiration for many of the locations in Derry. And speaking of Derry, when Richie's about to go on stage at the comedy club, a poster in the background says, Home We Go, foreshadowing the homecoming that the Losers Club would soon face. The next one we meet is Ben, and one of his employees in the board meeting is played by Brandon Crane, the very same Brandon Crane who played the 12-year-old Ben Hanscom in the original 1990 adaptation of It. After being introduced to the Adult Losers Club, there's one more adult version we meet other than Greta Keen, I guess. I'm talking about Henry Bowers, who is locked up in Juniper Hill's mental hospital, where some of the other patients are watching an episode of Tom and Jerry. This particular clip shows a piece of meat going down into the sewers, just as Derry's children are food that is lured into the sewer system by Pennywise. One of the new aspects of Richie's character in Chapter 2 is that he's revealed to be a bisexual. There are actually some hints about this early on. At the Chinese restaurant, he asks Eddie if he's married, before clarifying. What, to like a woman? Then he addresses Ben's weight loss. Wait, let's talk about the elephant not in the room. Ben, you're like, uh, you're hot. That's true. No, you're like every Brazilian soccer player wrapped up into one person. At the end of that meal, Mike fills them all in on It and shows off a couple of pages of his book. The novel It is broken up by these interludes written by Mike that provide exposition about Derry and about the monster. The film offers little glimpses of details about It, like this page that discusses Le Lupe Garou, the French werewolf slash skin changer that the kids discuss as they compare It to legends in many other cultures in chapter 13 of the novel. We can also see some other thoughts from Mike that I just found interesting, like him questioning if the deadline 
lights are just a hallucination, or his plans to save up money to leave Derry when it's all over, which he does. At the end of the movie, we get another look at this book, where we see Mike describing the bird form of it, which is his biggest fear in the book, and there's also a map of the proximity between where Adrian Mellon is found compared to where the lumberjacks are found in 1879, something that I discussed in greater detail in the Pennywise Horror History episode. Back at the hotel, Ben and Beverly talk at the bar, and one of the bottles in the background resembles a clown from the clown room in It Chapter One. And as long as I'm talking about connections to Chapter One, you know that music that plays during Penny's infamous dance scene? We can hear that again as Bill runs into the funhouse at the Dairy Canal Days Festival. I also pointed out director Andy Muschietti's cameo in the first video, but what I didn't realize is what he's browsing in the pharmacy. Like Beverly Marsh in the first movie, he's eyeing a box of tampons. By the way, after seeing my first video on It Chapter 2, Andy DM'd me with a couple of additional Easter eggs. The little bully kid at the opening is played by Katie Lundman, aka Betty Ripsom, in Chapter 1. He also hints that the Abbey Road album cover featured Paul McCartney walking barefoot. Conspiracy theories said that Paul was dead and that this was a signal. There's a shot in the movie where one of the adult losers is barefoot. Foot. Who is it? The answer, being Ben, did surprise me, though technically you do see Stan's bare foot as he gets in the tub, but he's completely naked, so I'm not sure if that one counts. One thing I was interested in taking a closer look at was the bathroom stall that Beverly is thrown into for her encounter with it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a whole lot of meaning in most of the graffiti, but here are some ones that I found interesting. The right side is all about BJs, and one of the messages says, BJs? Call clowns. So take that how you will. Another says, your father is proud of you. Perhaps Perhaps this is a mock insult about Bev's dad, or maybe just ties into the aforementioned BJs as kind of a joke. Then there are what seems to be three clues about how to defeat it. The first says, with the lights out, it's less dangerous. Then there's one that says, smaller the better. And then finally, big is what it seems. If you find anything interesting, drop me a comment, but I'm moving on to the plethora of references to other works. The first one is this nameplate at the library which says Wendy Torrance, the name of the mom from The Shining, which is also written by Stephen King. Then in the movie theater arcade, we see the remains of a poster for The Avengers. No, not the one you just thought of. I'm talking about the 1998 film, The Avengers. I haven't seen the movie, so I can't say much more than that, but it does add weight to my theory that the movie theater closed down in the year 1998. In the junk shop that Stephen King's character works at, there are a bunch of license plates, one of which is CQB241, the license plate from another Stephen King story, Christine. One thing I mentioned in the last video was a newspaper headline mentioning someone named Gillespie, and how it may have been a reference to a cop from Stephen King's vampire novel, Salem's Lot. And after being able to pause and take a better look at this text, it totally is a big reference to Salem's Lot. The headline reads, Constable Gillespie's investigation widens. Neighboring city turmoil forces officer into toughest decision of his career. This confirms that the events of Salem's Lot do take place in the nearby Jerusalem's Lot prior to the events of it, if we're going by the altered timeline of Muschietti's It films, and really seems to suggest that Salem's Lot will be the next Stephen King novel slash TV movie to get the big Hollywood treatment. And by the way, it is. James Wan's name has been attached to it, as well as It Chapter or two screenwriter Gary Doberman. My last thing he missed of the year is kind of a tragic one. Stan, in his final letter, the last thing he ever writes in his life, misspells the word lose. See, the thing about being a loser is you don't have anything to lose. Way to go out, Stan. Great going. Check out the video on the left for the complete history of Stan and other Rick characters. And if you love horror, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you next year. Assuming we both survive.